you asked me earlier, well, like, what does it take to get to the highest echelon? I don't think it is necessarily that you have to have real cello skills to become the, the great cellist, or you have to have great attorney skills to become a good lawyer, but you have to have a burning passion that that just goes through everything, you know, like if you read, then you read and you devour it. And if you, if you listen, you listen closely. So I think any kind of indifference is actually harmful to life and harmful to yourself. Welcome to the Atlanta Music Projects, the Next Movement podcast. I'm Dante Ramo, your host and the co-founder and chief executive officer of the Atlanta Music Project. Hailed by Gramophone Magazine as one of the finest among the astonishing gallery of young virtuoso cellists, German-Canadian cellist Johannes Moser has performed with the world's leading orchestras, such as the Berlin Philharmonic, the New York Philharmonic, Los Angeles Philharmonic, Chicago Symphony, BBC Philharmonic at the Proms, as well as many more, including the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. He has worked with conductors from the highest levels, including Ricardo Muti, the late Lauren Mazel, Maris Janssen, Valerie Gergiev, Zubin Mehta, and on and on and on, including Gustavo Dudamel. Throughout his career, Johannes has been committed to reaching out to all audiences from kindergarten to college and beyond. He combines most of his concert engagements with master classes, school visits, and pre-concert lectures. He was born into a musical family in 1979. Johannes began studying the cello at the age of eight and became a student of Professor David Geringas in 1997. He was the top prize winner at the 2002 Tchaikovsky competition in addition to being awarded the special prize for his interpretation of the Rococo variations. In 2014, he was awarded with the prestigious Brahms Prize. Welcome to the next movement, Johannes Moser. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, this is uh, the middle of a global pandemic. You're, uh, you're in Vienna. Um, how are you doing? Um, and what are your days like now that you are, are probably unable to perform for large audiences? Yeah, it's it's very strange because I, I do feel like I, I'm totally disconnected to my usual life because obviously I don't uh, travel at the moment. I don't perform concerts, as you said. I, um, I'm not able to travel to my university to teach there. So everything has moved to digital and that for me first of all is very interesting because i i get to cook three meals a day and i never get to do that um i also get to unpack my boxes because i just moved to vienna so so you know that i'm really becoming like very domestic and that is for someone who's been touring for 20 years is is unheard of and you know i just turned um 40 last year turning 41 next month and it kind of as as weird as that sounds, it kind of came at the right time because it was for for me. It's kind of a like a point of, you know, you can reflect like what what you've been doing and and also what you may do in the future, if we have to continue under um, different circumstances, which we all cannot predict. Um, but also, it's just really normal, mundane tasks as, uh, you know, shopping for groceries and cooking and, and uh, seeing friends, either they're online or now also, you know, you can go for a coffee with, with, uh, with people here in Vienna. So um, you, can, you can go to restaurants. So that is already- So you guys, Vienna bit. has started to reopen a little bit at least. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, and of course, you know, when you, when you go shopping for stuff, then you still have to wear a mask or if you take public transportation then you have to wear a mask, which is fine. And, you know, it's, it's funny because when you, when you look at people from, from Asian countries, such as let's say uh, Korea or Japan, like most of them walk around with masks anyways when they are in in the in the public uh sphere like if, if they are on a train 
it is normal for them to wear a mask. And mm -hmm. maybe maybe that is also something that that we are going to to um, adopt as, yeah, a, as we, behavior. We as don't a we don't know if we're going to go back to um, what we considered normal um, after after all this. At least in the United States. Um, mm. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting. Uh, you don't you don't you seem optimistic. Yeah, um, you don't seem. Um, are you are you concerned somewhat about what um, playing for the general public will look like after this? Do you do well, you think it's ever gonna come back to you know the big hall concertos? I think so. I I think there. Uh, there will be a form. I mean, he, here already they are reopening halls. Um, of course, you know, with with two meter distance or, or like six feet dis distance. So um, a hall that usually holds, I don't know, 2000 people will now hold like 400 or something like that. And, wow. you know, that, that's so it, the, the question is, if that is going to be financially possible and also if we are going to end up with just playing Haydn and Mozart symphonies for a long while because right. you cannot pack on, you know, a Schoenberg guru leader or a Mahler symphony on the stage. That's right. Um, That's right. And also, like, if, if you think that a wind player would have to have so much more distance to everybody else than, than all the other players, if, if our orchestra is too scattered, then then coordinating, as you know, and, and, and bringing everybody together is, is just very difficult. Yeah, the ability um, here, yeah. Yeah, to hear and also react. And, and, and as you know, I mean, so much of it is not just like an active act of understanding, but it's intuitive. And, and if you don't feel the other person next to you, like your intuition is, is it's just out the window. But if I seem optimistic or maybe not as concerned, it is because I, first of all, that is, I guess, part of my personality, but also I've given up worrying a little bit because if I now worry through this whole thing and this might take anything from a couple of months to a year or maybe even two years to recover, um, then that is also time of my life that is that is wasted, you know? And, and at this point, I'm just like, you know, I have no control over anything that is happening. Um, I can try to be as creative and as active within the constraints that exist, um, but I'm not gonna lose lifetime over, over this thing, just, you know, taking, taking things away from us. I mean, we still need to continue life, right? That's and, right. And I, I see people left and right that, that only talk about this, mm -hmm. like what, what's the new development? I, I see people that, that um, are very depressed by it, you know, like, like really, they were super down and with that they're not they're not contributing anything or they're not they're not changing anything you know and i i have highest sympathy for for people that that suffer at the moment i mean of course why you know why why would i um judge them but on the other hand like i i found a way for me where i'm just like you know okay then then this is how it is and i am lucky in the sense that i have a um teaching position Mm -hmm. and uh that you know that keeps the lights on and, that's right that's right you know, and, if i d didn't have that then it would be a problem and um yeah i mean here's hoping to a, a vaccine um that that mm. that works um it seems like that's what's going to be able to get us back to normal but this is definitely a chance to to reset we have to rethink how we approach music education and we're going to be focusing a lot more on obviously solo musical development we're going to be focusing on the development of um, audio and production and video so that our students can can produce high quality content that they can then mm. share with the world um, kind of like what uh, you've been doing for for years so um, mm. i just want to take uh go, go back to what uh pre-covid 19 johannes moser is like can you just take us I'm, i've always been curious for uh, a big you know, jet setting sort of around the world soloist. Uh, take us with you on the road. What's your day like on the day you have to perform a concerto with an orchestra typically? What is that like? Well, I mean, before that day begins, of course, I would, I would have had to travel uh, to a destination. And uh, if it's in a different time zone, usually I, I allow one or two days to acclimatize to the um, time zone so that I don't have hard jet lag. 
And then we usually have one day of rehearsal. And on the concert day, if it's the first concert, then there's a general rehearsal in the morning. And then I usually have some carbs for lunch and then have a good nap. Sometimes, you know, anything ranging from 45 minutes to three hours, like depending on, <laughs> on what the jet lag is. And yeah. that's actually the biggest perk of a concert day is that I can just pass out. <laughs> right, right. Um, and then I go to the hall, usually an hour, 90 minutes before the concert, warm up and, and then just, you know, try to do the best I can on stage. And it, one thing is for sure, there is very, very little glamour about traveling in general, but also traveling as a soloist. I mean, I don't jet around in a private plane and I, right, I don't right. have, have, you know, people cheering when I, when I <laughs> exit the plane. And I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's stressful. It is also socially stressful because so many people are so close together mm -hmm. uh, in this metal tube we call airplanes and uh, the air is, is terrible. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's especially hard for me because of course with a cello, I, um, I buy an extra seat for it, but still I have to go through security and I have to give the cello out of my hands and let other people touch it. And that of course, that can be nerve wracking. I'm sure. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's, um, because the cello is such a, it's not just an object, but it's an extension of myself and it's mm -hmm. an extension of my body at some point, uh, to, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, it just becomes very stressful. And but you, you have to give the cello at, um, that's, you have to put it, they, they, they pass it through the screening. You go through security yourself they pass and then it you get the it back. Well, sometimes uh, they now they have newer machines and it doesn't fit through. So someone will come around, take the cello, bring it to a different screening unit. And I, then I don't see it for like five minutes. It. And yeah. then, you know, and I mean, the other day I was in, what was it in Newark, uh, you know, passing through New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't even leave the airport. I just had to sort of pass through to go uh, to, to have another domestic flight. And there I am like putting the cello down and I'm like, you know, could I accompany the cello? And the gentleman who, who took the instrument was like, who do you think you are? You, th you think you're the only <laughs> musician in New York? You think I can handle this? I was like, well, I don't know if so many people pass through with a multi-million dollar, uh, you know, Italian cello. Um, From like 19, like 1792 or something like that. Oh, it's 1694. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's old. Yeah. It's, it's old, really yeah. old. It's not, <laughs> just any, it's not just any old cello. Yeah. No, and, and um, you know, I, I'm sure he was handling it to the best of his ability. But at the same time, I have responsibility uh, towards the owner because obviously I could never afford such an instrument. So I'm, I'm, I'm dependent on, on the owner. And um, I'm also responsible uh, towards future generations that hopefully, you know, I can pass this cello on to at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, these instruments, you know, they, they don't just grow on trees. I mean, there's a very, very limited amount of, of instruments of that kind. And uh, yeah, you want to make sure that you, that you handle it respectfully and um yeah and so i mean to make a long story short that that is where my stress comes from and i i'm trying my best to be zen about it and to just you know chill out where i can but it's challenging at times when when you uh, performed with the berlin philharmonic i think it was it might have been for your first time a few years ago mm -hmm. Um, I understand that you worked with like a, like a mental coach to mm -hmm. not only hone your uh, musical skills, but also, you know, the, the mind and the, and the body and the spirit has um, how, how what was the impetus for you to start using um, that kind of coaching and, and how has it affected you as a as a person and as a soloist? Well, I mean, the, so, so Berlin Phil happened in 2011. And so I had been touring for about 10 years. And um, I think it was the first time really when I felt this is a challenge that I cannot tackle myself. Like, I, mm. it's just too big for me. And, you know, people that grow up in the United States might feel like that when it comes to their Carnegie Hall debut or people that grow up in London for them it's playing at the, at the proms. 
But yes. for me, growing up in, in Germany, um, Berlin Phil, you know, is, is kind of the holy grail. And my, my dad had that big um, collection of the nine Beethoven symphonies growing up, the, the Deutsche Grammophon com- compilations. Oh, so yeah. I, I oh, understand. Yeah. I understand. Like, the, <laughs> whew. Yeah, exactly. That's the feeling. I mean, it's, it's like you, you feel like you are falling two stories. Like, <gasps> you know, what, what, what am I going to do? And so I felt, well, you know, every third rate soccer player or, or, or tennis player has a mental coach. And why should we all do everything by ourselves? And I went to this, um, this lady that, that coaches sports players, but also artists. And uh, she was great. We, we talked about what I wanted to achieve, which was going out of this experience with a positive feeling, not just having uh, tackled it to a certain extent, but actually having, having enjoyed the thing, you know, because so many, so many of the things that we do in life, you know, that we, that we strive towards, we, at the end, most of the time, the best we can say is, yeah, I, I pushed through or, or I, I was able to, I was able to accomplish, accomplish it or, or finish the task. But that wasn't enough for me. For, I, I really wanted to get, get through it and say, um, I did this also for me. I did this also for myself. Because uh, you know, these, these opportunities don't come flying all the time. So I wanted to make sure that I, that I take this with me. So the work that we did was visualization. So we, we, we visualized the, the performance day over and over and over again. But not just the performance itself, but you know, getting out of the taxi, getting into the hall, warming up, hearing the first sign uh, that it's time to to go to the stage, and then standing in front of the door. When it actually happened, I I looked around myself and I was like, I know this situation so well because I had done it so many times in my mind, and so at least it wasn't a surprise anymore. I don't get me wrong, I was still nervous as hell. Really, I was. I mean, of course, and my 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 pump was going 100 beat, 180 beats per second, mm-hmm. and like I was pumped, but I was able to convert the feelings that I got through that into emotions that were positive, rather than drowning by these feelings. Because here here's the thing: like mm-hmm. if you if you are really nervous, you get butterflies in your stomach, right? but you also get butterflies in your stomach when you fall in love. So yes. this is kind of, this is very similar sensation, but the interpretation of it is very different. The one is like, oh my goodness, I hope I don't mess up on stage, like playing. And the other one is like, oh, wow, this is exciting. This is wonderful. Like I want, I want more of this. So the work is to, is to sort of convert that, ex, that nervousness into one that is positive and, and helpful to a performance. Precisely. And I think, well, now what I do is when I, whenever I get that adrenaline rush, you know, that, that, that sort of explosion that starts here at the sternum and it just sort of goes through your body and like, <gasps> uh, what is happening? Um, I just look in the mirror and I say, thank you very much for my daily drug dose. And uh, because that, that um, rush of adrenaline is going to make me stronger and it's going to make me um, more convincing and it's just going to make me a better artist on stage. So. I turn something that used to scare me a lot into something that actually can work for me. And even if that means that I'm, uh, you know, messing with my brain a little bit or, or, or with like, just like cheating myself the reality out, of, out of the reality, <laughs> it works. And that's all I care about. You know? That's all that matters. <laughs> do, do you know the, um, I know cause you're, you're, you're Canadian as well as German. Do you know um, the violinist from Calgary, Helen Kim? Mm-hmm. She um, is the professor of violin at Kennesaw State University here in Atlanta, but she was in the Atlanta Symphony. She went to Juilliard and we had a, our violin players had a master class with her last week. And she said that when she was studying with um, Dorothy DeLay at the Juilliard School, that um, one of the requirements to learning a concerto was to write a screenplay to go with it. And, and not just um, a vague, you know, I'm thinking about this or that, but like, what's happening in your screenplay, who's talking to whom, how are they talking, to the, in, almost to the point where um, they had a, a, a in detail visualization of the performance of the, of the piece. And um, I wonder if, if anything like that, is that something that you've done as well? Or, or it seems like that's what you're sort of doing 
when you go through your, uh, the day of the concert and you're going in detail through what you're going to do, going through the doors and everything. Yeah, I, I like that idea of, of visualizing music and also maybe putting a, a conversational plot uh, to music. Is that, that is certainly something that I do a lot with my students. Um, it's like, well, if, if this passage wasn't just notes, but actually you would have to put a text under it and, and you know, a script under it. What is the conversation like and who is talking and how are they talking? On the other hand, um, I also like going into performances and just having sort of a rough framework and within that framework to create something that is very off the moment. Um, so, and, and that doesn't work with everybody. Like, uh, you know, you, you have some orchestras and some conductors where you feel you can, you can be absolutely spontaneous within within reason of course. I mean, you don't need to be ridiculous, but but, right. but w within reason to to stretch things, and people are willing and able to to come with you on that journey. On the other hand, there are um, there are collaborators that really want you to stick by what you've done in rehearsal, and that's fine too, you know. But but I do gravitate to more towards rehearsing a lot and then in performance, maybe doing something completely different, but because you've been rehearsing a lot, uh, you were able to explore the material in a way that allows you then to be relatively free with it. The, uh, the essence of sort of improvisation in jazz is still based in a foundation of music theory and, and structure. And so it's like, you know, when you, when you, when you want to be free, you have to be structured, you know, at, to some extent. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I want to ask you about all of the outreach that you do um, around the world. So in 2012, for example, you came to Atlanta to perform with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Uh, mm -hmm. While you were here, you reached out to us here at the Atlanta Music Project and you offered to come by and visit our students. Uh, you played the Elgar Cello Concerto for our students. Some of them are still with us today. Oh, uh, awesome. Great. Uh, you, taught, you taught a few lessons, you played some duets, and you took some pictures, and that picture of you and our kids hung in our, at the Gilbert House for, for many years. Um, it's still there, actually. Mm -hmm. Then you edited this video of yourself, and you, you posted it on your YouTube channel, um, thus giving us a little bit of, of promotion. You're, you're an international cello superstar, and you do this kind of visit all over the world. Um, what compels you, and you're good at it. What compels you to give back so much uh, to the communities you perform in? Um, so th there's, there's a, this is a multi-part answer. I have to go back to when I started doing this, which was when I was 18 years old. I, you know, was starting my studies and uh, I liked to party. So, so I was constantly broke. So I, I, uh, um, needed to play some gigs. And there was this organization that offered um, concerts in venues that don't usually get classical music. So there was everything from schools to music schools to hospices to hospitals to uh, institutions for um, young adults with mental disabilities and so on and so on. I even played in the women's prison. Mm. And uh, which was which was really interesting, by the way. Uh, it was really really an incredible experience. And and where were you? May I ask like, where you were in the in the world? Were you studying with David Geringas? Yeah, I was exactly. I was studying with with Geringas, and that was um, in Lübeck, so around Hamburg in in Germany, so so the north of Germany. But I've been with that organization in 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 Hamburg, in Berlin, in Cologne, and in Munich. So I, I you know all over, uh, because I I think they're just that great, and. Um, at the same time, when I started doing this, I had a crisis because I felt like what I was creating was, was not having any substance because I was not healing anybody like a doctor or I wasn't building houses or I wasn't you know, building bridges and all that. So um, I remember distinctly that I went into this um, facility for young adults with, with disabilities. And it was this young gentleman, he was in a wheelchair and he had a very strong Down syndrome. And as soon as we started playing, he started rocking back and forth and, uh, and screaming. And I, was, I had never seen something uh, like it. So I was shocked. Yeah, and I thought I had done something you know, terribly wrong. And I went to the caretakers and I apologized. I was like, I'm so sorry, I, we didn't know. 
And he said, no, 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 no. This was actually fantastic because Thomas, this young gentleman, he, he hasn't really spoken or, or, or make, made any sort of contact with the outer world in about two months. And, and, and this is the first time when he really expressed himself. And, I, and we think the music really opened those gates. And it was that moment when I was like, huh, actually, my music does change something in people, you know? And I can reach people to an extent that maybe words or, or other ways of communication uh, cannot facilitate. And um, that, was, that was a very strong moment. So, so I felt in that moment, okay, going out of the concert hall where we have you know, this beautiful ritual that's been growing for 500 years and I, I actually enjoy it. Um, but the ritual does not allow for very strong individual um, outbreak, shall we say, of, of, of reaction. You know, I mean, people that, that very, very seldom in a classical concert, someone will yell out, that's awesome. Or something right. like that. <laughs> <laughs> they they might say it, they might say it's not good, but the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they might throw tomatoes or yeah. whatever, but, but not, uh, but the, I, I'll tell you about another experience that I had that, that actually where that happened. Um, but it was in that moment where I felt, okay, this actually is something that is bringing joy to others, but also it helps me as a person. Because in our society, everything is so uh, squared away. Like, you know, of course we have, we have facilities for, for older people to, to go to an old folks home, so to speak, or, or for people with disabilities. But through that, we sort of push them out of our eyesight and we push them out of, out of the, the awareness. And that's not good because society is not just, you know, the, the, um, 18 to 45 year olds that, that Able, are like in, in their pr- exactly yeah. in their yeah. prime with, with jobs and with, you know, like, but like there, there's so much more to the, let's say the human condition and so much more to, to being human. And especially in the classical music universe, which, you know, we all want to pretend that it is, that it is not a, uh, not an isolated universe, but, but to a certain extent, unfortunately it still is it's so important for, for me to actually branch out and to find um, reality with my music in, in, in other circumstances. Um, but I wanted to tell you one story which uh, really changed my life in regards to, um, in regards to performance and, and the ritual that comes around, uh, about it. Because in 2002, I went on a very special concert tour. We went to Rwanda in Africa. Mm. And uh, this was actually, the, those marked the first classical concerts in Rwanda. So they, of course, they, they have um, their music there, their traditional music, but classical music was never a thing. So we came with an orchestra and I played, I think, Sassan's Concerto uh, and Haydn Concerto. And I remember that, um, first of all, we played in a, in a church with a, with a tin roof. And it, it, a rainstorm came down like you, you've never seen before. So, uh, and of course, it was amplified through that roof. So, so that sonic experience was, was incredible. And then we started playing and people were like real enthusiastic about the first movement. Then nobody cared really about the slow movement. So people were talking. And then <laughs> I got cheers when I was playing the third movement. Uh, when I did like a fast run or something like that, people were like, yeah, awesome. <laughs> and... Then when we stopped playing, everybody stood up and left. I mean, there was no applause because mm. it, was, it was finished, right? It was like, why would, why would they stick around and, and, and clap? And first of all, that was like a, a, a clash of, of cultures right there. And then uh, on the other hand, the Rwandan State Ballet performed for us. And they were incredible. Uh, really, I've uh, never seen something, something like it. But they were they were surprised about two things. First of all, that we didn't join in t- with a dance. And you can imagine like, like, you know, 30 German musicians trying to dance, you know, <laughs> it's not a pretty sight. But second of all, they were so surprised that we wouldn't clap rhythmically while they were doing it, but we were clapping unrhythmically, applause at the end. <laughs> and I love that because, because it shows that, um, that, both ways of um, 
you know, receiving art and, yeah. and acknowledging and, and, and sort of partaking can be so different from, from the context, but the appreciation is still there. And so, you know, when, when it comes to me going to a school visit and, and there is, there is cheers or there is laughs or there is um, booze sometimes, you know, whatever. Um, I accept or, or even appreciate that as part of the performance practice of the environment, you know, and, and if you go to school and that's how they react to whatever they see, I'm a guest. So, so I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, reacting to that environment. And, and that has actually been very freeing in a way, yeah, because um, so much of the concert ritual can feel like a regiment or can feel like it, it's 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 tying us down a little bit. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I feel more more free about it. So that's that's a long long story. Sorry, but <laughs> no, that's, those are two amazing um, stories, and I didn't know about that trip you took to Rwanda. That's that's amazing. Um, you said it was in two thousand and two. It was in 2002, and uh, it marked the 25th anniversary of uh, the German government um, having a partnership with the Rwandan government. And 2002 means that it was like, I think it was like seven or eight years after the genocide. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it's, of course, I, I also, I'm, I come from Germany, so, so we had a genocide, in, of course, in, in the, in the in 1940s. But to come to a country where this was relatively fresh also um, helped me understand the the maybe the history of my own country a little bit better, you know, because because there was the, you know similar thing going on. Yeah. You um, 2002 was a good year for you. You won the Tchaikovsky competition. Mm -hmm. um, what was your preparation like for? Well, first I guess I just want to know: Did you go to Rwanda before you won the competition or, or, or after? No, after. It was actually my first tour. Uh, okay. It was interesting. Um, the, the famous cellist Alban Gerhardt, he, he was scheduled to go on that tour. And I think his wife got really nervous because of the malaria possibility and, and because of all the, the um, drugs that you have to take because of it. And so he didn't go. So he canceled and I jumped in just coming fresh from the competition. And uh, I mean, you know, the, the musical experiences was the one thing, but we also got to see gorillas in their natural habitat and, and you know, in, incredible experience. It was really oh, I'm, I'll, I'm sure. I'll bet it was. Um, what was your preparation like for the Tchaikovsky competition? Well, I mean, I sound so pretentious if I say that, but, but I think my, my preparation for the competition started when I was eight years old, when I started playing the cello. I mean, it's really, you go yeah. to a competition and everything that you've done, that whole pyramid goes to that one moment uh, where you have to bring everything together. Now, I had to prepare 12 pieces consisting of sonatas and concertos and solo pieces, solo Bach. And you don't learn 12 pieces in, in half a year leading up to a competition. So I had to have some of it in my repertoire, some of it I had to learn new. But you sort of gather the things that you've learned over the years and you, you compile it into one program. And by gathering, I'm, I mean like you, you gather the repertoire, but you also, also gather the experience that you've had at other competitions. You also gather the, um, just, just the idea of, of, of you know, how, how are you going to be stable in, in such, a, such a situation. And I wish I had the support of my uh, sports psychologist before I went to Tchaikovsky, because I think it would have been a just, you know, that much more of an enjoyable um, journey. But uh, nevertheless, I, I went there and um, Moscow in 2002 was still very different to what Moscow is, is today. I mean, it was still uh, just, you know, 13 years after the, the, the whole Soviet Union collapsed. And, and so it was still quite rock and roll. And after three weeks, you know, after, after I had played the final and all that, I wasn't even really exhilarated. I just wanted to go home because I was just, I was just exhausted. I'm I sure it's lost. very, very stressful and very exhausting. Um, what, what did it? What was it like to win? I mean, what, I guess you said it was you, you were you were 
not that elated, but like the impact on, on your career, did, was that one of the important markers that kind of launched the career or were you already, you know, pretty established by that time? No, no, not at all. I mean, I, I actually wanted to go into orchestra um, because that's my, my father's uh, profession. And uh, I thought it was a good profession, you know, to go. And it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> but um, then when I won the competition, nothing really changed so dramatically like today, like you go on a winner's tour or something like that. I mean, I, I had one winner's tour going to Japan and to Korea and that was it. But what really changed was my outlook on what to try and what would be possible because I wouldn't even have tried a solo career if it wasn't for that for that competition and then i was like huh well maybe i can approach this in a playful way so what i did is i like i i would audition for conductor a and then that conductor would bring me to that orchestra and then if that orchestra hired me then maybe i could play for their resident conductor or i could you know then go on tour with them to this place and so you know building a like a monopoly um a board game situation you were like you were like a, a hustler of uh of, <laughs> of orchestras all over, all over. exactly <laughs> <laughs> it, it, re it really felt like that and and it was it was very playful and it was a lot of fun and somewhere in my mid-30s i kind of lost that a little bit because it, it it just became very serious and also the competition just became very very strong mm -hmm. but I'm starting to regain that sort of playful aspect of, of having a career, which I think is very important. I mean, if, you know, the, the travel is uncomfortable and you're away from home, I, at least I'm away from home uh, 250 days a year. Um, I, the social life is very difficult uh, on all, all these things. Like if, if it's not really worth it and if it's not really satisfying or, or fun or however you want to call it, then, then, it's not worth it. <laughs> then it's not worth it exactly and and life's short and and you know there's different viewpoints if if we have one life or more but um one should one should really also consider that you're not just here to have a career but you are here to to live a life and yeah. and and live a meaningful life and and so finding that joy and that that playfulness and that fun in my career again was was very important for me yeah, it's it's a long it's a long. I've realized that too as a sort of like a, a young professional. Mm -hmm. I started the Atlanta Music Project when I was uh, 27. Now I'm 37, mm -hmm. and yeah, only 37, right? Like it's a long time, and we have to reinvent ourselves um, along the way. Mm. Your mother is the Canadian opera singer Edith uh, Weens. Am I saying that properly? Weens. Yes, absolutely. Weens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Weens, and um, she's currently the chair of the voice department at the Juilliard School. Your father, as you mentioned, uh, Kai Moser, mm -hmm. uh, was a cellist in the Bavarian Radio Symphony. How did you get your start in music? Well, I, I got my start before I was born because my mother was touring until her eighth month of pregnancy. So I got, you know, soprano <laughs> and orchestra and deluxe. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like that, that is really my system. And now when I hear recordings of her, um, like it, it, it touches me in a way that I'm not just, ah, this is nice, but actually, ah, this is part of my upbringing very much. So, mm, wow. um, and my parents, you know, they brought me to music education when I was two. So, you know, you, you dance in a circle and you, you, you hit some drums and it's nice. It's very playful. It's, yeah. it's, it's cool. And I always enjoyed uh, those groups and also the performances that they, that they put on. Um, and then I started with violin when I was five and switched to cello when I was eight. And um, I remember distinctly when I was sitting down with the cello and, and, and you know, uh, going over the strings for the first time and feeling those low frequencies, that really did something for me. That, that really, um, shall we say, that, that, that really resonated quite literally with me on a level that I could not comprehend at the time. Because as, as an eight-year-old, you don't analyze, oh, do I want to play the cello or, or would I rather go into this? No, you just do stuff, right? Yeah. And, and, and you do also as you're told. And so <laughs> uh, that, that, was, that was my thing. However, I will say that very early on, my parents said, well, you know, you're responsible for, for your practice and you're responsible for your cello. And 
that feeling of responsibility and of ownership very early on was something where I felt like, huh, this actually is, is mine. And this is something that I, that I can um, be in charge of. And, and so you didn't need to be pushed to into the, the, the practice regimen. That was something that- No, you, no, hmm. quite the contrary, quite the contrary. And to this day, I love to practice. I mean, you know, in, in these Corona times, there is no real necessity for me to, to practice the Haydn Concerto, but I mean, uh, it's just such a joy. And, and hmm. I, I love the, the exploration part. And, and so many people ask me, well, what do you like about practicing and, and what can you pass on? Because some people might struggle with it. And, you know, I don't solve Sudoku puzzles. I, I make fingerings for a Haydn concerto. You know, okay. I, I think right. it's, but I think it's the same thing. It's like you, you, have, you have an obstacle, you have a piece that is unbeknownst to you and, and you don't really know how to, how to tackle it. And then you find a strategy and you develop that strategy and then you, you, f you develop tools to, to get to it. And then you turn it into a piece that you've learned, you turn it into a performance piece. And, and that is also a, a catalyzation um, moment. And I mean, it's such an exciting process. And I, I'm very sorry for people that don't like to practice because then that's, the performances are only half hour long or, or one and a half hours long, mm -hmm. but you have to practice a gazillion hours to get there. And if you don't like the process, but you just like the promise, and even at the performance, you're so nervous, you don't, you don't enjoy it. Right. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, you know, <laughs> play soccer instead. <laughs> the, um, the, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you a question about sort of being at the highest echelons of, of any craft, right? Um, I was gonna ask you about the sacrifice that it takes to get there. You, we've all heard, you know, the Michael Jordans and the, the Bill Gates, the Beyonces, you know, what it takes to become the best in the world that your craft it can take, you know, almost an obsession um, requires sacrifice, you know, to the point where it, it might challenge friendships and, and relationships. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, um, I feel like you enjoy the process, but um, what's, what's been your experience as you've climbed to the top of your profession? Hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned Michael Jordan because in the last two weeks, um, I've been watching uh, the last a dance. lot of, you know, well, last dance, I, I couldn't see, but I saw everything about it. So oh, now I can't, I can't, you wait can't watch it in that. Europe. You can't watch it in Europe. Is that what it is? Um, I think you have to subscribe to something, but yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't find it yet. But, but um, I, I, I'm dying to see it because this is so, so, so interesting to me. I don't care about basketball at all. Like that is not a thing for me, but, but you're I, so tall. <laughs> <laughs> well, not not like the Michael Jordans of the world. I mean, right. <laughs> those are towers, of course. Um, but uh, I'm interested in what what takes somebody else in a different field to this extreme, and and to really dedicating every thought and every second to to this. Now, um, I because I haven't had that idea of becoming soloist as a child, I don't feel like I had any sacrifices in my childhood, you know, um, because I know, I know quite a few young musicians that grow up with very eager parents. And, you know, the parents come to me and they, they have glowing in their eyes and they say, Oh, you know, our daughter is, is not, uh, she, she stopped uh, ballet practice and she stopped uh, soccer practice and she, she's not reading anymore. She's just doing music. And I'm like, well, that's not the way to success. I think if you, if you want to be a rounded artist, you need to have as many influences and as many things in your life as possible um, to, you know, to become an interesting human being and, and then subsequently being an interesting artist. Um, but I think when you look at someone like Beyonce or, or, or Michael Jordan or whoever you, you mentioned, yeah, Bill Gates. I or Bill Gates or whatever, I don't think that these people have to, have to force themselves in the morning to do what they do. But I think there is a calling and there is a magnetism where it's like, I have to get there as quick as possible. Like Bill Gates, have it, I have to get into my garage and, and, and build that, you know, uh, circuit board. And, you know, I, I, and you hear about, um, 
uh, Michael Jordan or, 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 or um, Pippen or, or whoever, you know, of, of, of that Bulls team. I mean, they, they would work out after games for two or three hours. You know, I mean, that's the level of dedication. If, if you look at the pianist Oscar Peterson, jazz pianist, from Montreal, he was, yes. He, yeah, exactly. He, he was playing a show. And then they would start rehearse after the show. And sometimes to two, three, four o'clock in the, in the morning. And, and they would, I mean, they were already great, but they were like, no, we want to be stratosphere. And I'm sure they, they, they weren't like, ah, oh, do we really have to do this? Maybe occasionally. But I think there was some sort of magnetism that, that, that just made it easy. And... <laughs> There is a fantastic book called uh, The uh, War of Art. And in that book, the message basically is, well, if I, if I may boil it down, um, it's not hard to practice six hours, but it's hard to sit down to practice six hours, right? And if you can ov overcome that first hump of being like, well, maybe I should have a coffee before, or maybe I just do quick emails and yeah, or, the, the yeah there's something on Instagram yeah. it, procrastination is and here's the thing I don't understand and and that is also the topic of, of that book is like the thing that you love you still procrastinate like starting doing it and to this day I don't know why it's it's really puzzles me the, but uh, there is some some sort of function in our body that that keeps us from doing it yeah it's like we we need to work in order to uh to be successful but it's like there's also this, um, I feel like the, it's, as human beings, um, we weren't necessarily put on the earth to create Microsoft or to be superstar bassoonist or cellist. We were, we were put here to survive. And so unless there's something that threatens our survival, we tend to check Instagram and, and lounge and, and relax. Um, I went to the Yale School of Music for grad school. And of course, Aldo Perzo was mm -hmm. the, uh, the cello professor there for 60 years um he, he yeah. passed away fairly <laughs> recently as i'm sure you know exactly. yeah, but he, sure. he used to tell a story he used to say you know when he was young like you know before he was a teenager he would get up brush his teeth and go play scales like there was no you know like life was very simple and he just wanted to play scales he wanted to play well and so he would just he'd forget breakfast and just wake up and play scales mm. um speaking of, of legendary cellists you uh, were one of 12 cellists from around the world that performed a virtual tribute to the late cellist Lynn Harrell. Uh, did you ever have any interactions with Mr. Harrell? What are your memories of him? Very briefly, I met him once at, uh, I listened to a master class that he gave and I went to him and I said, I'm a huge fan and, and I want to thank you for all your amazing work. And he, he, was, he was incredibly nice, but I did indeed grow up with his recording of the Herbert cello concertos, which are not very known, but these are fantastic pieces. But of course, I heard him in performance with Shostakovich concertos. I heard him on, on record with, with all the big pieces. And uh, yeah, he was someone who had a very, very distinct sound and one of a kind. And this is... I don't know if this is something that is that is a little bit lost today or if we just have to be so versatile in different genres of music that the individuality is sacrificed because of that a little bit because we just, you know, now we have to play Baroque with no vibrato and then you have to play Dorjak with a lot of vibrato and then you have to play Ligeti in, 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 a, in a different way. So we become more musical chameleons, but people like... Lynn Harrell or Daniel Schafran or Yo-Yo Ma or Heinrich Schiff. Those were cellists that you, you would turn on the radio and you would, you would recognize oh, them instantly. That it's them. Yeah. yeah. And, and that is, um, that is incredible. Yeah. And also in that tribute that we played for, for Carnegie Hall, where, where this uh, 12 cello ensemble was, was broadcast, um, they played a short piece, uh, Kol Nidre, uh, that he that he performed, um, I think, for the Pope. So you know, it, it's this big Roman, um, uh, almost like an amphitheater, and uh, and then with the orchestra, and there he is, playing that piece. And I was thinking, it's it's incredible because it's so individual, like it's so Lynn Harrell, mm -hmm. right? And it's mm -hmm. it's so him. And um, yeah, that, um, that, that, that has inspired me a lot, actually. 
Lynn Harrell's playing is is distinctive. I think it's powerful. I love his his as a bassoonist. I love his um, Bach cello suites. Um, he sort of reminds me of of Jacqueline Dupré. How how good do you think Jacqueline Dupré could have become? I mean, she was seems like she was just incredible. Her Elgar is just it's not a, it's almost as good as yours. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, how really though? How, how... I, I, I think I think she's a, well, especially with Elgar. I mean, she's unsurpassed. Um, but it's, it's always a good question, you know, what, what could have been, what could have been if Schubert had another five years, what could have been if Mozart had another 10? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I, I just don't know how to, how to answer that question. What, what I do know is, is that um, Jacqueline Dupré or, you know, Schubert or, you know, genius is that, that died at an, that died too early, I should say. Um, they've inspired people to an extent that uh, people that live 80 years sometimes have not, you know, and um, I think, I think it's, it's important that no matter what you do, you try to, to be the very, very best um, at any given time, no matter if you're 16 or if you're 60. And I mean, I think, Jackie Dupre, I, I've obviously I've never met her, but from what I understand, um, seeing her videos and also um, seeing some documentaries, she was a force of life, right? And I mean, if, if, she, if she would have been a flutist or if she would have been an attorney or if she would have been, you know, whatever, I think that force would have come to light and that force would have, would have shown in, in some way. And and so if you ask me, you know, what, 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 what does it, you asked me earlier, what, like, what does it take to get to the highest echelon? I don't think it is necessarily that you have to have real cello skills to become the, the great cellist, or you have to have great attorney skills to become a good lawyer, but you have to have a burning passion that that just goes through everything, you know, like if you read, then you read and you devour it. And if you, if you listen, you listen closely. So I think any kind of indifference is actually harmful to life and harmful to yourself. And I don't know if, if it's a fashion, but I, I hear a lot of, when I, when I overhear conversations, let's say at the airport and, and people are looking at their phones and I don't know, anything between the latest news disaster and, and cat pictures, you know? And, and then, you know, you hear them engage in the conversations. It's like, I don't know, I don't care. I don't know. It's, it's, and it's like, well, what do you care for? Is it, is it, is, are you, do you just want to be cool with your indifference or do you actually burn for something? And I think life is more interesting when you burn for something, honestly. Yeah. Pa passion is, passion is important. And the key, um, yeah. The there's one like famous story about uh, a young um, I forget which basketball player it is, but he asks Michael Jordan out of at a camp when he's a teenager. He asks Michael Jordan, like, what's your best advice for me, you know, to, you know, as I go through my, my life becoming a professional basketball player. And Michael says exactly that. You have to love the game. You mm. have to love the process. You have to love the journey. Mm. And um, yeah, passion is so important. I want to just ask you one last question about this body of knowledge that he, like, like you were saying you don't just have to be able to play the cello in order to tell a great story as as an artist in order to be an interesting and attractive um artist to people that may not know the elgar concerto or people mm -hmm. that may not know the classical music even um mm -hmm. and then we'll maybe take some questions from the uh the, the atlanta music project students um i'm so impressed with the knowledge a classical musician has to have to be well informed about playing uh, it's not just about being able to play the notes you have to know the historical context and where the composer's mind was at and understanding the different styles and approaches how how did you or how do you come to absorb this vast body of knowledge for for playing the cello i know that you're a voracious reader for one but how do you continue to absorb and learn and grow well I mean, you know, one, one good thing you see behind here is, is I, I like to read. And as you can see here, there's still a lot of space 
uh, to be filled <laughs> with new books. So I, I've bought a shelf that is slightly bigger than, than the books that I have, so I can actually fill it up with, with more stuff. I mean, I heard an interview with Simon Rattle, and he said something that I think applies to, to most musicians that are hungry for knowledge. This is, is the, the conductor says, of the Berlin Phil, right? Simon Rattle. Exactly, the former conductor of, of former. Berlin Phil and now, now of, of um, London Symphony. And he said, like, he learned something every day. And every day he asked himself, how was I able to conduct yesterday or last week without the thing that I learned today? Mm. And, and this is so true. Like I, I will read something right now. I'm very much into Haydn concerto and I read about classical style and, and I read about intonation and all that stuff. And every day I discover something where I'm like, how was I able to play or teach or think about this music without this one piece of the puzzle? And that is fascinating to me because you know i've i've been around classical music for some time now and i do know certain things but i certainly know that i know very very little and with every day that i learn something i know that there is so much more to learn and i i hope that to the to the last day of 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 me working in music or any any kind of task that interests me that the fascination and the joy of learning is something that that will that will stick with me um because it is not learning something in an abstract way and then you, you store that knowledge somewhere, but it, it, is, it is applied knowledge. It's, it's knowledge that you, can, that you can use right away. Um, and if it's a book of, by Harnoncourt or if it's a book by Leopold Mozart, the father of, of um, Wolfgang, uh, of Wolfgang, thank you. Um, there is information to be found that, that yeah, it just changes everything with just a little, little piece of information. And I love that stuff. Yeah. As I get older, it's clear to me that curiosity and passion are linked. I don't think I, you can be, you know, well-versed in anything if you're not curious, because that's how you, 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 you learn. Speaking of curiosity, um, let's bring on some, uh, some students. Great. Why don't we, let's have a quick conversation. We'll just do one question at a time. We'll go in a, in a round. So let's start by doing just, you know, your name and, and, and who you are, maybe your age. And then we're going to give Mr. Ishmael the first question. So I'm in, I'm in the, the South United States. We say Mr. and Miss, and Miss but Ishmael, you know, he's <laughs> clearly <laughs> young and able-bodied. Okay, let's do a quick introduction, starting with um, uh, Sage. Go ahead and un unmute yourself, Sage. And Kendall, we can't see your face. You got to bring your computer down, your screen down a little bit. Okay. Hi, my name is Sage Lima Jeffries. I'm Hi. a cellist. I've been playing with the Atlanta Music Project for three years, and I also sing with the choir. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's a great intro. Great. We'll, we'll, we'll take that, and we'll come back to you. And then, um, Kendall, um, hopefully you'll, you'll come back to the the. Uh, the screen very soon. I'm going to take you off video for a moment and hopefully you'll come back with uh, your face in the, uh, in the picture. All right. Ishmael, go ahead with your question. All right. Well, Good sorry, morning. I'm sorry. Introduce, introduce yourself. I'm sorry. Introduce yourself. All right. My name is, first of all, how are you doing, Dante? Hey, I'm doing good right now. This is a great interview. Right. <laughs> I, see you back, I see you back at the center. It's great to see you. You too, brother. Yeah, yeah. So my name is uh, Ishmael Akbar from Atlanta, Georgia. I've been teaching the Atlanta Music Project for seven years now. And um, you guys haven't made it easy for me to come up with a question because you've discussed so much. And I'm always, you know, so impressed with the Atlanta Music Project and the output that uh, these guys put out for, for the public. Mm -hmm. But um, I would like you to kind of um, hit on the importance of uh, classical music in, in Vienna uh, in the past and how important um, is it that you're in Vienna right now uh, and how does that kind of change your interpretations for students and audiences who, do, who don't know. I think uh, Vienna was a, a big hub point musically for Mozart and Haydn and uh, Beethoven and Brahms and so can you and there's a very strong like a strong it seems to me from the outside the strong tradition of doing things the Vienna way the Vienna Philharmonic way Right, that's, right. Uh, that's absolutely correct. And um, 
you know, I just moved here in December. And, and so now that, that Corona hit, like th these are the, the first months where I'm really starting to feel Vienna rather than just, you know, knowing about certain things. And what I'm looking forward to is uh, just engulfing myself in that atmosphere and, and really getting a, getting a feel for, for what it means to play music Schubert, of course, you know, being being one of the protagonists in, in, in your list that you already mentioned. Um, I think that there is something said for for strong tradition, but I think there is also a danger with tradition because tradition also means that you may not question what has been before you. And so I think questioning certain beliefs and and bringing let's say new knowledge or, or bringing bringing forgotten knowledge into into a discussion or into an interpretation is something that is extremely important and you know if you compare let's say the beethoven symphonies of fortwängler with karajan with Tielemann, with Simon Rattle. I mean, let, let's just say that this is like sort of the progression that, that Berlin made over the years. I mean, we're only talking about 70 years of, of musical progression, but it's, it's changed like night and day. And who is to say that what is right or wrong? It, it doesn't exist. It is just changing to a certain taste and it's also changing to a certain circumstance. And I think as fascinating as it is that, you know, the Vienna Philharmonic still plays from parts that Gustav Mahler conducted himself. You know, I mean, he, he, he premiered the symphonies in Vienna and then the people still play the Boeings that Mahler suggested. I mean, you don't mm -hmm. get closer to the, to the source than that. But do we need to stick with memories or in interpretation or is it not also good to bring in you know, what, what, what concerns us today? I mean, what, what does concern us today is that we're in lockdown and that, you know, government is a certain way and, and that, you know, that, that there are still a lot of uh, social issues that, that, that uh, we, we have to tackle and we, we, have, to, we have to bring um, to the forefront of, of, of people's minds and also hopefully to a solution at some point. And, you know, political issues all over the world. And those were maybe not concerns that a Gustav Mahler had. Yeah. And to to take our reality and our now out of the equation of an interpretation feels incomplete to me. I don't think it's wrong. I just think it's incomplete and it's it's insincere to 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 the now, shall we say. Yeah. And you you chose to live in Vienna, I'm guessing, because you got a teaching post there? No, I still have no. my teaching post in Cologne. I Cologne, wanted to okay. move to Vienna because I, um, I love theater. And mm. I, uh, I have uh, about two or three really fantastic theaters here. Of course, now they're closed. But um, I, I didn't want to move back to Berlin, that would, which would have been the other um, hub for culture, shall we say. Um, and as I never lived in Vienna, I thought, well, why don't I give it a try? Why don't I see what it's what it's like? And because it's a musician's hub, I already made a, a, you know dozens of friends here in a very short amount of time. And uh, it's of course home is where, where your friends are. So so that's that was important. Yeah. Sage, ready for? Uh, go ahead with your question, Sage. Okay, my question is, how do you um, create a unique sound to set you apart from other cellists? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's a fantastic question, not only with sound, but also interpretation. And, and we, we, we always try to be different than others, right? Because, because we want to stand out or also we want to, um, well, we want to do something unique. And in my experience, the best way you can stand out with a unique sound is to try to be the best version of yourself. It is not conducive to success if you're just trying to be different and inducing things that don't really come from within, but they come from the outside, you know? It's like 
let's say you're you're are, are you vegetarian or or you eat meat? Yeah. Or, yeah. You're vegetarian. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're always so, we're always having to get Sage and her siblings an extra meal because they have a very specific and. <laughs> okay. Good. Now <laughs> I, I, funny I was that you asked for that. I, I was mentioning cooking a steak, but but we're we're gonna go with like <laughs> if you if you do a beautiful vegetable quiche or something like that, uh, you can either try to make the best version of the quiche or you can make a mediocre quiche and put as much ketchup on there as possible. Okay, and the, let's say the ketchup is is the stuff that comes from the outside, mm -hmm. and if you are able to create something that is meaningful coming from yourself then you don't need so much condiments from the outside, but you can, you can actually just stick to, um, stick to the best version of yourself, shall we say. And now, of course, the question is, how do we do that? And um, I personally think that listening to as much music as possible, not just classical, but, you know, anything from, you know, pop, uh, I don't know, hip hop uh, to, uh, to jazz, to, to, you know, going back to, to the roots of, of where hip hop came from. And, and you know, it's like, uh, it's actually funny uh, when, you, when you look for the, the snippets that are being sampled for some of the, the popular rap songs, when you go back and, and you see all, yeah, those are all 70s hit records, you know, and then you're like, oh, what, what, what were they like? Well, 70s hit records, they, they came from music that maybe had uh, their the, the roots um, 50, 70, 100 years back. So uh, through that, you can also go on a, on a very interesting uh, journey. Um, and that, you know, leads us to all the way back to, to let's say the 1500s when, when uh, classical music was, was created first. What I'm trying to say is listen to as much different stuff as possible, read as much different stuff as possible, watch as many interesting movies as possible. And, um, you know, get to know uh, interesting people that, that share that passion. And I think then you don't need to create something unique, but you will become unique. Yeah. And um, I struggled, your question is great, because I struggled with exactly what you're asking for many, many years, because I tried to be something different from anybody else. And then I discovered, well, wait, through that pursuit, I'm just moving away from myself. And, and that's not the way forward, I think. I, I think you need to try to, to see what's within and then try to identify with that as, as much as possible and, and believe in that. And um, that, will, that will bring the biggest individuality in your sound, I think. Great question, Sage. We're so proud of yeah, Sage. Thank you. Thank um, you, Sage. We have this system here in the um, United States. I'm sure you, you know the Allstate system where kids audition in um, middle school and high school to um, be part of an ensemble of the best musicians in their state for their, for their age range. And Sage was the first cellist from the Atlanta Music Project to make it all the way to Georgia Allstate. So. Congratulations, Sage. That's huge. That's fantastic. That's really great. Sage, um, what are you and Mr. Ishmael working on for solo repertoire right now? Um, we're working on Song Without Words by Mendelssohn, mm -hmm. um, the first prelude of G major Bach suite, um, Elgar's cello concerto, the first movement right now, and Colnidre. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Wow, that's lovely he's repertoire. He's re ready for a competition. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. Um, Ishmael, you have a question, another question for Johannes? How did you know? <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, I just want to say, Johannes, I think, honestly, sometimes being born in America can become the antith antithesis towards, you know, not crafting something in your hand that's like an instrument, you know, like being in a studio. Uh, all day. And I mean, that's wonderful too. But uh, how can we encourage our youth uh, in America or how can we make up for lost time for, um, you know, having like, you know, music in the household, you know, because for instance, right. or, or in the schools, when I had a, in 2003, I got a chance to go to St. Petersburg, Russia. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that, um, that the visual and musical arts are uh, within the curriculum in all of the schools. 
And um, I heard you talking about your background and you growing up in a musical household and you know, you, you're dancing with your family and et cetera. Um, my mother actually uh, was a dancer. Uh, oh, fantastic. Okay, uh, and great. We, and we go see Alvin Ailey a lot. Um, it's a uh, it's an all black uh, musical theater. Uh, I I know. Do they 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 tour right. quite a bit, don't they? Uh, because they 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 are based in Manhattan, I think. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, long story short, how do we? Uh, how can, you know, on, on the American side of things, how can we kind of make up for for that for that lack of um, artistic um, you know union in the household or in schools? Yeah. Well, it it that is a very very sensitive and important point that you that you mentioned because I feel that so much of my education has come from that nucleus of the family, right? Um, and there were evenings when, you know, let's say instead of our, my parents reading to us, they, they would say, well, why don't we listen to this record, Peter and the Wolf, uh, you know, like, why don't, we, why don't we listen to it together? And I think, sitting down and listening to music rather than having music sort of just being a background noise is something that is kind of a, of a, of a lost, maybe lost art or also lost, um, yeah, just, just lost habit, you know? And the ubiquity of, of access to music does not mean that we are listening to more music. That's the, that's the weird thing, right? Like I can open Spotify and have, everything that's been ever recorded at my fingertips. And what do I listen to? You know, well, maybe just another podcast, you know? So <laughs> it, it feels like, like I'm, I'm missing out myself, yeah? Um, and I think what we are missing right now, also in Europe more and more, is a curator. Like 20 years ago, if I went to a record store I'd be like, what should I be listening to? And they'd be like, well, listen to this, this, and this, and this. And then if you've listened to this, and then you tell me what you like, and then I'll show you more. And I think, you know, your role in, as, as an educator, just as, as my role as an educator with, with my students in Cologne, um, you know, this, this very talented young cellist comes to me and she plays the Strauss Sonata. And I'm like, well, you play Strauss Sonata. Have you listened to the Rosen Cavalier? Have you listened to uh, Electra? Have you listened to Salome? He's like, no, I don't even know these pieces. And it's like, I think our role as educators and um, as, uh, as people that are in the know uh, to say, well, then you need to broaden your horizon, right? Um, but... I don't know. Everything is, is so uh, instant gratification nowadays. Like, it, it takes stamina to sit through a Bruckner symphony. Like, you know, that, that is not something that just happens by itself, but you, you just have to really plow through. But if you do that two or three times, then it's actually fantastic. I mean, it's actually such a, such a rewarding journey. But it, it takes effort on, on, on everybody's part, right? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm giving you a very unsatisfying answer to, to your question just because I don't have a recipe to, to, to pass on. So I apologize for that. Um, but the, I, I think Europe often is perceived as the holy grail when it comes to the arts from an American perspective. And I can assure you it's not. Yeah, like we, 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 have, we have enough schools that have canceled arts and music classes as well yeah and, and we have we have enough schools where classical music is is as foreign as i don't know the chinese alphabet just to to name something yeah and that is that is in the heart of berlin and that is in the heart of vienna and that is in the heart of hamburg and and you think well you know those are centers of the arts but just because these are art hubs it doesn't mean that everybody is running around reciting nietzsche you know, it's, it's just, <laughs> I, I wish, I wish I, I had more knowledge on Nietzsche, but I don't, <laughs> but um, I think once art is discovered, not as, as just another subject, but actually as nourishment for the soul, like it feels good to see an exhibition and it feels good to read, then that's a leap forward, in my opinion. And in my experience, because, you know, I, 
I go out of a exhibition and, and I'm like, wow, now I'm, I'm hungry for more. Like uh, now, now let's get back to the cello. And, and I'm not saying, well, because I saw Picasso, I'm going to play the Haydn more in tune, but I say, well, because I saw Picasso, I, I saw excellence and, and now I have something to strive towards. So it's, it's not a one-to-one -one exchange, I would right. say, but it's, it's more like a general inspiration. I'm sure you've experienced that as well. Atlanta is so rich in culture. I mean, it's 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 a great city for culture. I would say, right? and so Amazing. many great, yeah, and so so many great groups are already there, like the Atlanta Symphony and and, and uh, the Music Project. But as you mentioned, Alvin Ailey, I mean, I'm sure they they come once a year to tour through um, through the Arts Center, and many many other groups do as well. I I looked through the season brochure, and of course now everything has has kind of stopped, but yeah it's it's a fantastic city and i always enjoyed it yeah. we're very lucky in atlanta because it's you know some would argue it's the the mecca for for hip-hop right now and mm -hmm. so many so many groups um and great you know international superstar musicians um have roots or have uh, come through atlanta or move end up moving to atlanta and living here so really and you know atlanta um for example, we, we just had our virtual graduation last year for our class of 2020. And mm -hmm. um, T.I., you know, the inter famous international rapper, he was who's down the street, and, you know, was able to himself, you know, record a video to congratulate our, our seniors. And so That's that awesome. is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, a Atlanta is a special place. Um, and you've got- Now, in terms of, of hip hop, is it also uh, production and studios and all that? or? Um... Is it mainly uh, artists come come from Atlanta. So many producers and artists mm -hmm. come from Atlanta. You know, I mean, so the, cool. the, the list goes on and on. And and um, the the mix between our students who grow grow up, you know, the majority of AMP students grow up in around the culture of hip hop, and then seeing how they mix classical music um, is really interesting. And and I think as they get older and as they get better, you're going to have students like Sage you know, and Donovan that have these very unique sounds because of the uniqueness of where they're growing up. Exactly. Uh, Sage, you have one more question for, for Mr. Johannes and then we're gonna um, finish out the interview. Yes, I do. All right. Okay, so my question is, how do you organize an ideal practice day? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say you have a certain amount of time, let's say you have how how much do you usually practice just to get a ballpark? I try to practice two hours a day. Cool. So if you have those two hours, um, you want to make sure that you maximize what you um, uh, what you get out of that time. Now, one thing is is really important to keep in mind is that we don't make progress while we practice, but we make progress in the night after when we sleep because that is when our brain is processing what we've been working on during the day and puts it from the, from the front of our mind into the back of our mind. Uh, and that, that, that's what we call learning, yeah? It's like at the gym, you don't grow muscle at the gym, but you tire your muscle. And then as a reaction, the muscle grows overnight when you, when you have rest. So when you have, first of all, when you have a really good practice day, make sure that you also get some good rest afterwards because that is when what you've been practicing is being transformed um, as something that you've learned. Now, the best way to, to practice is to find that sweet spot that we call flow, which is that you practice in a way that is not boring, but also it is not too challenging so that you always feel that you're, you're falling short of your expectations. But you find that sweet spot in between. Um, let's say you have a piece that you know, has some hard passage work and you, you turn on the metronome and you can play that passage well at the tempo 60. So maybe in the next day, you'll put it to 64 and the day after you put it to 68 and so on. So you progress slowly. So it's good not only to have a practice plan for a piece for the day, but also for the week and maybe for a month, okay? So let's say your goal is to go to 138 with a tempo, but right now you can only do 60. Then you just kind of, okay, I, each day I can go four clicks on the metronome maximum. And then you just calculate how many days that is. And, and, and then you have a plan for that. Um, what I do recommend is that before you start practicing is that you warm up your body. 
so that you do just a little bit of exercising so that you don't warm up at the cello, but your body's already warmed up. So your blood circulation is going like, you know, just do some, some, uh, some uh, jumping or, or I don't know, jumping jacks or whatever, you know, just, just, just to, to get the system going and go in small chunks. So if you, if you have a two hour time frame, then I would go for 40 minutes you can set a timer and in those 40 minutes there is no distraction so so you don't go to instagram or facebook or or, or twitter or spot of or tiktok i don't know if you do tiktok but, <laughs> and so, so so none of that none, none of those yeah dances and um then no, no tiktok exactly so <laughs> and then after um after you finish those 40 minutes you get a five minute break you do some stretching in those five minutes and you, um, you just sort of reset your body and then you do another 40 minutes, okay? And before you start those 40 minutes, you say, okay, I wanna accomplish page one and the half of page number two in those 40 minutes. And then that's what you're trying to do. Um, and uh, then, then you take another break, maybe for 10 minutes and then you, you, have, uh, you have another, I think 20 minutes left or something like that. And then you, you practice maybe again, slowly what you've, what you've done, just, really going through it slowly so your brain can memorize it so in your sleep you can you can process it um or you practice something that you want to practice the next day and you're like okay i want to look at it already today to make a plan for tomorrow and you know like this those two hours will have will have sailed uh sailed by and um another thing that i do recommend and we all have cell phones now is that every day you just record a little bit of your playing and you match, you try to match your expectation of what is coming out to what is actually coming out in the cell phone, yeah? And there might be a discrepancy. You might think, oh, this was awful. And then you look at it and you're like, wow, that wasn't half bad. Or you're like, I'm the greatest thing since the invention of bread. And then you look at it and it's like, ah, okay, I still have to practice a little bit to actually get to that point of excellence. And through recording yourself and to watching it back, you get a very honest uh, feedback system, yeah. And yeah. also, when you um, when you record something today, listen to what you recorded today in a week, and then you can see your progress. That's also very nice, and that's very motivating, yeah. And uh, yeah, practicing is a creative um, is is a creative task in itself. And that's why I love practicing. Like you can be creative on how you craft your, your two hours and how you design your two hours best to your best liking and also to the best of, you know, hopefully making progress. Uh, but it sounds like with all the accomplishments that you've been doing that, that, uh, that you've already been very successful with your practicing. So congratulations, that's, that's awesome. That's really great. Excellent questions, Sage. Excellent questions. We are very proud of you. Ishmael, thank you for your hard work. And thank you guys thank you. for getting up early um, to join. Yeah, us. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> time difference. So sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. We appreciate you as well, Johannes. All right, guys, I have uh, three final sort of quick questions for Johannes, and then we're mm -hmm. going to close it out. Okay. Thank you so much for taking time to, to speak with, uh, with Ishmael and Sage. I know that they are uh, they, uh, I know that they've seen you on YouTube and they're, they're, they're cellists. And so they're, they're understandably yeah. probably very um, thankful for the opportunity, as am I. Fantastic. Great. Um, just three quick questions. If you were not a cellist, what do you think you would be doing with your life? Theater director, movie director, or uh, architect. I would love to do those things. Amazing. And you seem like very, like the, that was an easy question for you to answer. So you, you know you. <laughs> Those are my passions, yeah, exactly. Terrific. And then um, our mission at the Atlanta Music Project is to empower underserved youth to realize their potential through music. What empowers you as an artist? Um, to having found what brings me joy and pleasure every day and to have been able to turn that into my daily profession and daily passion. I don't even like to think of it as a profession, but really more of something that I'm fortunate I love to do. And also it, it somehow pays my bills. So I'm, I'm just very, very lucky in that sense. Yeah. 
And the next movement was the name of the Atlanta Music Project's uh, capital campaign to, to raise the funds necessary to establish our, our headquarters here. What's the next movement for Johannes Modze? Hopefully, we're going to move back into the concert hall soon. Until then, my big movement is in the digital sphere, where I do a lot of master classes and I do a lot of online performances as well. And um, yeah, my, my next move is to stay connected with audiences of all backgrounds and of, of all, um, part, in all parts of the world. And um, hopefully transmitting the joy of music that I feel every day into other people's lives. Oh, that's fantastic. And I've seen your Instagram masterclasses. You've had a great online presence um, for many years, but those Instagram masterclasses, I've, I've listened to them myself because you're giving away information that, um, and knowledge and sharing it with, with, uh, with that would otherwise might cost, you know, tuition, you know, to go and, <laughs> and receive. Yeah. No, I wanted to keep it free because I, I feel mm -hmm. like this is the time when, when we, we have the opportunity for community. And there is no need for me to to earn like a few extra bucks when when actually the possibility arises when we can create something of togetherness and and, and I feel that's that's worth much more. Johannes Moser, international jet setting or or plane taking cellist. Uh, we thank you for uh, being with us today on the Atlanta Music Projects, the Next Movement podcast. Thank you very much, Dante. Thank you.